Okay, well, welcome to Google Code Jam 2021. This is going to be my set of screencasts for the Google Code Jam, which I have done for, well, this will be my third year now. Um, I, I've gotten a surprising number of views for these screencasts, so I, I thought maybe I should probably introduce myself for, for those of you who don't know exactly who I am and what I've done in the competitive, competitive contest community. So um, I'm Derek Kisman, uh, otherwise known as Snapdragon in a lot of video game and competitive programming circles. Um, I was I, I started competitive programming way back in 1997, in my first year of university, and um, we competed in the ICPC finals. Uh, got third and fifth, which was pretty good. Uh, it was it was a different crowd back then. It was <laughs> it was easier to get third and fifth, um, and. Uh, I did not do the IOI because Canada, actually my last year of high school was the very first year that Canada competed in the IOI. So I was a bit too late to, uh, to make it to the IOI, but I did, I did do the IMO. I got a silver medal in the IMO. So after my ICPC uh, finals in my first two years, um, my ICPC career was over, but I kept on doing competitive programming. And um, later on, other sites came by, particularly TopCoder um, in, in the 2000s. And by then I was, I had actually kept practicing and I was really in my prime. And so I, I was number one on top coder for a couple of years. And that's, that I think is the main source of my, of what, what renown I have. <laughs> um, that was 20 years ago or almost 20 years ago. Uh, I have not kept up my practice. I have not kept up with modern, modern algorithms and stuff like, um, so, and I'm old and, <laughs> Uh, so I, I'm definitely not at the same level that I used to be. However, I've still done pretty well in the Google Code Jams. Um, I, I should retire, but I have been doing the Google Code Jams pretty consistently. I mean, I, I was at the finals for the very first Google Code Jam way back in 2000 something. Um, but, uh, yeah, I've, I've, I've sort of kept it up and I've been doing these screencasts lately. And the one good thing about me not being a particularly serious competitor is that I can do commentary while I while I solve the problems. So um, in previous years, I have I have done commentary on my thought process while while going through the problems, even on even on round three in the finals where it sort of hurts you. Um, I was lucky enough to get to the finals last year, so that was really exciting. Uh, I managed to get a a round three qualification in on, on video, which was great. Um, Three years ago, I also made it to the finals, and before that, quite a few times. Um, it's probably going to get rarer and rarer. The smart money is that I'm going to make it to round three, uh, <laughs> but we'll see. I mean, I, I could I could fail out on round two as well. Like if I have a really bad day on round two, then that is entirely possible. So um, anyway, that's that's who I am. Um, so. Uh, I think this is the only screencast where people will do commentary because the top competitors, you know, they're going to focus on the contest and uh, you're not going to hear their thought process. The, the, the downside, of course, of hearing my thought process is that a lot of the things I say during the contest are going to be wrong. So don't necessarily assume that I know what I'm talking about when uh, <laughs> when I say, oh, this problem is blah, 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 and then I don't solve it or something like that. You know, possibly that's because I, I did not figure out the problem within the five seconds that, that I looked at it. <laughs> um, you can see the, the contest has been going for a while and some familiar faces. Gennady, who of course has won this, I think, six years running, which is pretty incredible. Um, and uh, Erikto, I, I really like uh, Erikto's Twitch channel. Uh, Erikto and EC Nerwala have, have pretty good Twitch channels. So uh, if you like these sorts of things, if you like these sort of educational screencasts, I really recommend Erikto's because he uh, he um, he goes through a lot of beginner level problems and he explains his thought process and he tries to explain how to how to get better at coding contests and he also does some deep dives into particular topics so I, I think he, he does an excellent job of doing doing some teaching streams on uh, on Twitch and YouTube if you don't have if you don't have Twitch if you don't have YouTube I don't know how you're watching this so you probably have YouTube <laughs> So I, yeah, I do recommend Erecto and EC Nerwala's streams for more of this content. Anyway, okay, that's enough preamble. So of course this is the qualification round, so there's no time limit, like no no real time limit. 
um, they usually do have a hard final problem. Kind of looks like this is a hard final problem, uh, which I may not manage to solve, but we'll see. Sometimes they sometimes they dump a problem that is just not suitable for the rest of the contest into the qualification round because it's an interesting problem, even though it's not particularly fair in some ways. Um, we'll find out. So I will. <clears throat> I mean, I, I, I will get started and you can watch me <laughs> possibly stumble through some easy problems. Okay, here we go. Let's uh, open up a, pro a problem. Reverse sort. Okay. Seems pretty straightforward. Simulation problem. I mean, it's not like n is is large, so you can easily just do an, an uh, n squared algorithm, which is it's interesting that they actually give you a permutation because it doesn't really seem necessary for this problem. But yeah, unless I am misunderstanding it. All right, let's uh, let's give it a try. I'm not covering anything, right? Yeah. What should I call this? I guess I'll just call it a.cc. I didn't bother typing up my template because uh, <laughs> because it's the qualification round. Uh, time time doesn't really matter. Um, Okay, so that's reading in the input now. And this does go all the way, right? And the cost is, the cost is exactly g minus i plus one. Okay, so even reversing a single element costs you one. That's fine. Um, find a minimum. I, I could call min element. I, I don't actually like using min element. Um, I find it clunky, but this is clunky too, so yeah, whatever. Um, okay. Um, so that's the cost, and then we have to actually have to do the reverse, which which I am going to use an STL operation for, because <laughs> it's just easier. Um, oops, this is minj. All right. I do have some code that automatically adds uh, includes like that, the includes that I need. It also it also pulls in templates from my from my book library, my book code, when I need it. I just find it's it's nice to be able to auto, like not not have to search through my book for particular algorithms. I can just pull them in automatically. Uh, I mean, not that seconds really matter this much when I'm, you know, when I'm slow and and old and I'm doing this commentary, but uh, you know, it's it's convenient. Uh, that is the problem with C++ is that you constantly have to pull in includes and stuff like that. Um, anyway, 
So we can just copy the input file. So you can see I don't really have any sort of um, IDE or anything like that. I just used VI. Um, I think in modern times, IDEs are probably going to be a competitive advantage. Um, it's just I'm lazy and I haven't really, uh, haven't really gotten into competitive form on them. Okay, so I'm slightly off. Looks like I'm off by one now. I could just subtract one and submit, but uh, let's try to figure out why I'm... Oh, okay, it goes up to length L minus one. So it actually does optimize slightly <laughs> because you know you don't need to do a reverse on the last thing. All right, so we're done. Uh, let's see, how does this, how does Google Code Jam submitting work? Um, So there is no, is there a, yeah, there's no hidden test data for this, right? This is just seven points. Okay, surprise, surprise, I got it right. That was obviously not a hard problem. It's purely simulation. Here's what we're, here's what we're asking you to do, just code it. All right, they will get harder, they will get much harder. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, well, this is this is dynamic programming. <laughs> This is about the minimum possible dynamic programming you can possibly get. It's it's got two states. <laughs> at each at each point, I need to remember two states: the the minimum cost if the last character was a C, and the minimum cost if the last character was a J. <laughs> that is uh, pretty basic. Okay. Um, I'm not missing anything, I assume. I mean, this is this is the second problem, so I expect it to be easy. Uh, just checking the constraints. You never know when they're going to throw some. <clears throat> something at you that requires, you know, big ints or something like that, but not big ints, but 64-bit uh, integers. But obviously these costs are not going to get too large, a thousand times a hundred. So don't need to worry about that. Um, okay. Um, I will, <laughs> eh, all right, <laughs> let's do this in constant, constant memory, woohoo, just because we can. So int cc is equal to, uh, uh, let's see, the first, the first character is actually a bit annoying. Um, the first character is kind of a special case. So, yeah, I, I just don't want to make three states just so that I have to have the, the, the no character state for the very first one. So I'm going to start from one. Uh, 
this is, I mean, you could easily be lazy and you, you don't have to do it quite fancy like this. Uh, but uh, whatever, it's the qualification round. Speed doesn't matter. Um, I can be a little bit fancy. I, I, I do generally prefer to do dynamic programming by recursive calling. I find that much easier, like recursive calling with memoization. I find that much easier to match my mental model. And um, matching my mental model is really the key to doing well in competitive programming, in my opinion, is that the closer that the code uh, matches how I'm thinking about the problem in my brain, um, the the more likely it's, it, it is to, to work, like on the first try or with minimal debugging. Okay. So anyway, uh, so just have three cases here. I don't like using switch statements. So I find I find the uh, C plus um, plus. I find the C++ syntax for switch absolutely horrible, especially the part where, you know, you have to end everything with break. That is one thing that languages like Golang have fixed. Uh, the, the idea that like falling through should not be the default, falling through from a case statement should be, should have to be explicit. So yeah, I try, I, I basically never use switch statements in my code just because the syntax is so horrible. And if I do use them, I always put them in, uh, in blocks and, and I always make sure that there's a break at the end. Okay, um, where was I? So yeah, uh, um, so CC two is forced is equal to min CC or JC plus. Um, wait a minute, this isn't, I, I don't even need to do dynamic programming, do I? I might as well continue and do, finish this dynamic programming, but really the answer is the same, even if I remove all of the question marks. That is really funny, actually. Because you're always, you only pay a cost if you change the character. So you're obviously just, it's op optimal to always just use the last character in a question mark. Um, the the one thing, like if there's a question mark at the beginning, then you'll always just uh, use the next character. But okay, forget, forget this. <laughs> this is not even dynamic programming. So, um, so X is going from C to J and Y is going from J to C. Call it something different so I'm not confused. Um, so yeah, I'm just ignoring all of the question marks. So I did not I did not hit upon that really easy solution right away. I was doing dynamic programming. Um, oh, that's interesting. They're giving Oh, okay, I missed this. Should read the, uh, I, for some reason my eyes saw this and I thought that that was the entirety of the input, but there's also extra credit here. Test three is, yeah, okay. Test three, test three, I think it is easiest to do as a dynamic programming, so I will do that. Uh, because the problem is, I mean, you could heuristically do it because what you're going to want to do is 
sometimes switch as often as you can, depending on whether x plus y is less than zero or greater than zero. Um, so you, there probably are heuristics you can use to, to figure out what the question marks are, but whatever, just do dynamic programming. Why, why would you never, why would you not want to do that? So anyway, um, So th those are just the costs of swapping. Um, obviously, you have to end up as CC or JC. Uh, this is C cost and J cost. You have to end up as, as C or J if the if S is fixed. Otherwise, you have a choice. So um, like otherwise, you can just do both. Um, really, it, you could combine this. So like you could do if S i is not equal to J. You can do that. This is actually a little more elegant. Maybe not elegant, actually. Like sometimes when you do shorter code like this, it's actually harder to read, and this might be one of those cases. So I don't always recommend doing shorter code like this, but um, yeah, uh, th this is it is kind of neat that it works this way. <clears throat> Okay, uh, so I think that's right, and then I've forgotten to count that. I did do a bit of iteration on this easy problem, <laughs> which is a bit embarrassing. test case. It is a bit annoying that they that they give it to us in these in this separate format. Okay, so what do we have? Five, eight. Oh that's not good. Um and that is for the one that has Am I not counting JC correctly? Uh, these are symmetric. Oh well. Looks like I actually need to debug. And this is this is where an IDE does come in handy. You could actually just run it without the the input, but or I mean without the oops. You could run it this without the uh, debug output, but um, oh well. Anyway. Okay, so case number two, one. That's forced to be, okay, now it's forced to be J, but it's only costing, do I have X and Y swapped? C to J. Yeah. That was my problem. Okay. <laughs> I just got, this is, like I said, if, if you write it like this, it is a little bit less elegant, like it's a little less readable. It's neat that it's small, but it's a little less easy to understand all the cases and what's going on. So uh, you do lose a little bit, and that's that's why I made that mistake of forgetting which was X, which was the case where I was switching from C to J and which was the case where I'm switching from J to C. Um, anyway, looks like this is right. So there aren't any problems. Like using dynamic programming, there are no problems with negative numbers. It's just going to... It's going to go down below zero f just fine. So, um, I feel pretty confident in submitting this, even though there is a hidden test case, which is why I'm being a little bit uh, careful for the for that extra one point, super valuable one point. <laughs> it is funny that they did that. 
also funny that my initial impression was the one that solves the extra case. <laughs> All right, so we very slowly solved this one, probably. Cool. Moving on. All right, so this is the counterpart to reverse sort. Reverse sort engineering. So the last paragraph. Oh, OK. Um, okay, so this isn't bad. So let me break out my pen. Woohoo, I've been looking for an excuse to do this. So say say your goal is like six. And uh, just to explain the problem statement, you are now trying to actually produce the list that has a certain cost yourself. So say say you want to produce six. Well, you, you figure out some cost that works. So um, the, the, the worst, the highest cost you can possibly have is if you have to do the whole list uh, you have to reverse the whole list and then you have to reverse the rest of the list and then and so on so the, the worst possible cost you can get is uh, n plus n we'll use capital n which is going to be like n times n minus 1 over 2 minus 1, probably. Maybe I've got that slightly wrong, but yeah, I think it's actually plus 1. But anyway, um, it, it doesn't actually matter. So anyway, so this is the highest possible cost you can have, and obviously the lowest possible cost you can have is 0. Um, oh, sorry, not 0. Uh, lowest possible you can have is n minus 1, because the... Is that right? Let me... Yeah, you can't have. Two, one. Yeah, it, so this is the case n minus one, and so that's that's the lowest possible case where the list is already sorted. So anyway, so that's the this is the min, this is the max. Anyway, suppose you've got a c. So th this is the first part of the problem. So suppose you've got a c and you you've somehow decided how to break it up into integers like this. Well. In order to determine whether it can be broken up into integers like this, well, first you're going to you're going to do a greedily. So first you'll place an n if it fits, and then you'll and then you'll place n minus one if it fits, and then and so on. Um, you know that that way you're not going to run out of numbers. Uh, you're not going to get to the end, and you're going to go, oh well, I've only got a two left to place, but it's not high enough. So anyway, you do this greedily, just placing the largest numbers first. Anyway, so you've got some breakdown that is some subsequence of this uh, of c, and now. Uh, all you're doing is you are um, you are constructing the list. You need to construct the list so that it has that cost, but that's actually not that hard to do. You start from the sword, sword list and you go backwards. Um, like the thing is, the reversing permutes the list in kind of an unpredictable way if you're going forwards, but you don't have to go forwards. You can just go backwards, and then and then it is once again a simulation. You are just simulating the reverses as they happen back in time. Um, so yeah. So anyway, you're gonna you're gonna go from from two up to three up to up to n minus one up to n. Well, for, first you have to figure out the breakdown. So that's actually kind of fun. You have to you have to do the breakdown top down. You have to do it from from the you have to do the 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 breakdown of c in this direction. And then you have to for the actual simulation you have to go in this direction. Um, because uh, because that's the easiest way to do the simulation. Okay. Um, I didn't really use my, my whiteboard much, but it is fun being able to write. And uh, maybe maybe there will be some problems where I can actually make use of that uh, in later in later problems. Okay, uh, so we're done with B. Do, 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 do. Normally, I have this typed out in a in a template, but uh, again, it's qualification round, so who cares? Um, okay.
So like I said, we do this greedily. Oh, sorry. There is there is the concern. Okay, I, I did miss one part. We are forced to have a one, so I don't want to actually. We are forced to have a one in each position, from from one to n minus one. So the, the 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 minimum I can do is n minus one, not zero. So in order to correct for that and make this nicely greedy, I am just going to uh, subtract. Uh, so now the costs are from zero. I, I'm changing the costs so that they are now the length of the of the reverse section minus one rather than the length of the reverse section, and that's you know that's trivial to do. You're just subtracting one from every cost. Um, yeah, now it's greedy. <clears throat> now you're doing this. Okay, um, so now we've got our list of costs. Now we have to go backwards. Um, Producing the list. I guess this is why they gave a permutation in the first problem, so that uh, the, the answer to this second problem is, well, it's not unique, but it's a little more constrained. Okay, so V is now in the final state, the sorted vector now. Um, Um, this is actually interesting in that uh, I am never going to use, so this is actually a little in interesting here, what I'm doing. Um, for, for a given, say for the very first one, I could have a cost anywhere from zero to n minus one, but I never need to use anything in this, anything between this range, uh, anything in this range. So in fact, all I, I need to do is zero or n minus one, zero or n minus two, zero or n minus three, which makes my simulation a little bit nicer. Um, I am only doing maximum lengths. In fact, I think, in fact, I might not even need a simulation. I might just I might be able to just uh, place like a decreasing list at the beginning and or at the end and an increasing list at the end at the beginning. I'm, I'm not sure. I'll have to look at what the the outputs actually end up like. But um, but yeah. So I, I'm not actually using all the possibilities here. I don't need all the possibilities here. So all, all I'm doing is I'm, I'm I'm using the maximum I possibly can at any given time. Uh, and this will this will never fail because it goes all the way down to one. If this didn't go down to one, if this went down to like three, then this might fail at the end because I would have to, maybe I would end up at two and I couldn't subtract, I couldn't subtract two from it. But that's not going to happen here. So uh, there there are some subtleties to this problem, and uh, you know nothing nothing that has ruined my uh, my initial impression of the problem. But uh, you know there are a couple of subtleties. Okay. Um, so this is just going to be I, I just I'm actually just going to reverse the So for a cost of one, say I'm going to reverse the last two elements. And I think this works. Um, I should also do the impossible case, of course.
I'm sure there's some very short code that does all this in Python. I'm not a Python guru. I am a C++ guru. <laughs> There's no extra hidden set, is there? This is just, uh, it's, it's funny. The only hidden set they've given us is that one point. <laughs> um, okay, so this is not agreeing with their results, so. Four plus three plus two. So really this should be four plus two. So yeah, this is this is definitely wrong because um, you know, I will I will just for the first step I will reverse this list and it'll now be in sorted order and the cost will be four. So that's wrong. So let me just print out all the costs. That's not right, is it? Is this wrong? If C is great. Uh... Oh, wait. Oh, this is right. Sorry. Yeah, so this is a cost of four plus one plus one, which is six. Okay, that's right. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. That one should be. Yeah, okay. I, I mistakenly thought that my output was wrong just because it doesn't match theirs. But of course, theirs is, uh, theirs is not unique. So for this, this one, that's a cost of three, and then it'll be one, two, four. And then it'll be cost of one, then it'll be cost of two. Okay, uh, so this should be right. They don't really have good test cases, so I'm gonna try submitting and if it's wrong, oh well, because the test cases are visible. I don't think it'll be wrong. Wrong. I think it's gonna be right, but um, we can find out for sure. There really is no penalty because this is the qualification round, so who cares? Uh, if I if I wanted to compete for the top of the leaderboards, well, first of all, I can't, and second of all, I would have had to start, you know, at six a.m. my time. So, <laughs> uh, is that right? And if this fails, I will have to come up with some better test cases because these test cases are not really that strong. Do, 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 do. Spinning, spinning. Okay, that worked. Not surprising. It, it's it's not actually that hard a problem. Like it, like I said, there are a few a few things you need to be careful of, but there's certainly nothing that that are uncommon in these programming contests. You, you see these sorts of tricks quite commonly. Like the thing where you subtract n minus one at the start in order to get everything into a more convenient form. Um, cool. Uh, well, these two look like they are going to be more of a challenge. So let's find out. Is my recording still going? Yeah, my recording is still going. <laughs> Good. Median sort. They like their sorting problems. There was a sorting problem which was amazing. Or sorry, no, it wasn't a sorting problem. Oh, there was a random shuffle problem which was amazing in a previous Google Code Jam. I love that one, where you were supposed to determine whether they, you were given a randomly shuffled sequence and you were supposed to determine whether it had been correctly or incorrectly randomly shuffled using a probabilistic argument. It was it was such a cool problem. I love that one. I think I think Piotr wrote that problem. 
you probably know who Piotr is. <laughs> he is ineligible to compete in Google, Google CoJam because he actually works for Google. So that is that is one spot that I don't have to worry about in the finals. <laughs> anyway, let's get to the, the problem. Oh, interesting. Sorting without actually comparisons, without like a, a compare, not a comparison based sorting. That is, that is very unusual. Huh. There is a hidden verdict. There's a particularly tough one. Okay. So this is like an optimization problem, which with, with a non-obvious lower bound. The order for each case, so they do tell you the order is, for each case is generated uniformly at random. So you are not given, you are not given worst case test input, whatever worst case means for this kind of thing. I mean, often for sorts, the worst case is either a sorted list or a reversely sorted list. <laughs> so you are not given sorted lists. Well, they usually do have a uh, <clears throat> an interactive problem just to introduce you to the concept, um, since they do they, they have been putting interactive problems in pretty much every round in the last couple of years. So this is this is just sort of an introduction to the concept. Uh, I, I don't think well these test sets are probably not going to be hard. This set I suspect might be hard, and I will have to figure out how their testing tool works. So they have some sort of testing tool. Um, By the way, do I have enough points? <laughs> I mean, I'm sure I have enough points. Uh, yeah, you only need 30 points to advance. So um, these, like I said, these these tend to be bonus problems that are not, for some reason, not suitable or perhaps introductory. Like the, probably the reason that they put this on is just to introduce the idea of interactive problems. And you don't actually need it in order to advance. I've already advanced even even if the, uh, oh yeah, the, the only hidden test set so far was a one pointer. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. Whew, so I don't have to be nervous. Whew, that's a load off my back. <laughs> I, I think if I failed during the qualification round, I'd probably not upload this video. <laughs> so <laughs> the fact that you are seeing this video there's an anthropic effect that I must have passed the qualification round at the very least. <laughs> uh, 
Um, okay, I'm goofing off. I, uh, how do I think about this? I guess I'm trying to avoid thinking about this because I'm not sure exactly how to think about this out loud. Um, So it is. Is this working? It is kind of interesting the example that they've chosen there. So what they've done is they've removed the median of each of these and then added in another one. So I don't think they would actually give a hint like this if this was really a, a correct algorithm, but maybe you could try try the first three and then remove the median and compare the next three and remove the median and compare the next three. And then what does that give you? Um, Okay, so this covers all the cases except if x4 is the median here. So if either, so, so if any of these are the median in the first case, then that's symmetrical. And we can just, you know, without loss of generality, we can assume that it's x1. Here, without loss of generality, we can assume it's x2 or x3, but we can't assume it's x4 because that's going to be a different case. So suppose you have x1 and x4 like this then in that case, so you know it's going to be like this, these two could be reversed, and these two could be reversed. So that's the case where it's x4. But the case where it, the case where this second comparison is x2 or x3, then you know that it's like this. Uh, it's either x1, x2, um, or it's the reverse. Are there any other si situations where that? No, sorry, I've got this wrong. So we know that x1 has to be in the middle of x2 and x3. Whichever, whichever side we pick for this. Um, so we will arbitrarily pick a side. We will arbitrarily say that x2 goes on the right side and x3 goes on the left side. And I think that forces all of our later decisions. So then you do x, x2, x3, x4, and if it's x2 or x3, then you know that you have to place it on, you have to place x4 on the other side of the median. So if it's x2, then x4 has to go on that side. If it's x3, then x4 has to go on this side. <clears throat> now, Yeah, so the, the problem is, so this third case will distinguish, sorry, the second case distinguishes between x4 going here, here, or either here or there. Now, suppose we've got, I'm going to actually go to the whiteboard because this isn't enough space. So I, I'm not really thinking theoretically about, a, about the problem, I'm just taking a small small examples and I'm trying to work through them. So suppose, so we've gotten, without loss of generality, we've gotten this far. Like we will always have this knowledge from the first comparison, no matter what numbers we use. So we might as well use one, two, and three. Um, so yeah, so the, the cases that are left are, if it goes there, there, or there, or there. Um, and really like if it goes, if it goes here or here, we can treat these, these cases as equivalent because we now know the order or the reversed order of these. So we know that it's either this or the reverse. And then um, once again, if we did say x, x2 and x4 and x5, then there's also the question of, is it, is it always advantageous to just add one new element each time or is it advantageous to say, pick groups of three like the uh, like the linear time median algorithm where you pick 
where you divide it into groups of a certain size and then you find the median in each of those groups and then and then you find the median of medians and such like that um, A divide and conquer solution like that might actually make sense. So, sorry, let me. I, I'm doing a digression to think about this. So, so if I've done this. So then these are going to be in the middle. And suppose I recurse to, to sort those properly. What are the hardest limits? The hardest limits are 170. Uh, so n is equal to 50, so I'm allowed 170 comparisons for a list of length 50. However, I don't have to worry about the worst case. I just have to worry about the average case. So I need an average case 50, or 170 comparisons for a list of size 50. Okay. So the problem is, even once I've got this sorted, then all I know about this x4 is it either it's to one side of this or it's to the other side of this. Uh, and x3 is going to be the opposite. So whichever whichever side x4 is on x6 is on the other side of this this sorted list in this sorted list which is not that much information really i'm not sure that this divide and conquer is working all that well so let's go back to the the situation where i am just adding one new x at a time let's see let's see how much i can like on average i can expect that to work um so yeah suppose i've got a list here Let's just suppose I've got a list, a sorted list. I'm not going to bother writing the x's, but so without loss of generality, I've got a sort, sorted list here. Um, and I'm trying to figure out where, where x8 goes. Then, I mean, if I, if I compared x1 and x, x7 to x8, then that would, that would narrow down these two cases. Um, but it would leave all of these cases in one blob. That doesn't seem ideal. So really what I should do is I should try to split it. I should probably try to split the search base um, into three equal parts. That's probably going to get me the best results. So if I can split it into this case, something like this. So I would, I would want to compare 3, 5, 8 in this case. Well, this is a viable solution. So what I can do is I can just keep on, I can I can take my current list that that I know the the full sorting for, and then I can take x eight or I can take x n plus one, and I can divide the space up into threes, use the median to determine which which of those three possibilities it goes into, divide it up into three again. So basically, at each new new step, I will be doing log base three of n operations. And you know what, this actually feels fairly optimal because here's the thing. All of the cases where, like this is evenly dividing all of the, all of the future cases. Like these, I am not 
at every at every point for every comparison I'm making, I am doing my the best I can to evenly split the um, the the possibilities the, the the state space into three evenly spaced uh, parts. Now it's not perfect because because like this is three two three, so there is a bit of a, a disadvantage there. But it, you know, in in the asymptotic asymptotic large case it is it is split evenly into three and i believe that these are all like you you can ignore the rest the placement of the rest of the ends these these spaces like the, the cases the cases where eight goes into this into one of these slots and the cases where eight goes into one of these slots and suppose that i had three spots here and the cases where the eight goes into one of these three spots those evenly split the state space so I believe I am doing the best possible job I can get. Each of the three different po res possible responses from 358 would be giving me um, as much information as I can possibly get in terms of reducing entropy. Um, anyway, I, I think that this is the correct answer. So uh, I could do some math to try to estimate how much it would cost to sort a list of like 50. Um, back of the envelope, uh, I can afford to do like, you know, 3.5 comparisons and three to the 3.5 is like, it's almost 50. Um, so back of the envelope, it actually looks like I am roughly in the range of 170. Um, the only way I could really improve this, like you could improve this by splitting the state space in, in smarter ways. Uh, that seems really hard though. Like there, there might be ways where you introduce more than one number at a time, which splits the space in a particular way. Uh, but I, I feel like this is fairly close to optimal and, and I don't know if they are evil enough that you really do have to be super optimal <laughs> then then i guess this problem will defeat me <laughs> but let's let's try it so let's uh let's find out exactly um how many how many uh operations this requires um this will also help refresh my memory on how to uh How do I make sure that the yeah I don't need to sync input I just need to sync I, I need to I need to make sure that I put uh, that I flush I have to use endl when I'm writing output so that it flushes uh, and, and the judge isn't waiting for input that I haven't flushed yet which is a common way to fail interactive problems uh, okay. Actually, I guess it's just and I don't really care what Q is like I I'm fine with time limit exceeded if if my problem fails like whatever I don't need that extra bit of info um, so <clears throat> I, I can pretty much just ignore Q and, and just try try using queries and make sure that and, and see whether it works um, yeah, so So I believe the first query is special just because I have to pick whether I want to do Uh, actually, let me, let me do this. So th I think this is the most elegant way to start it off. Um, if I if I start it off such that I have arbitrarily put one and two in that order, 
if they're flipped, if two and one are the other order, I will end up with a reverse, reverse of the sort. But I think this is how I started off. And then everything else is just generalized from that. So, um, is x. So this is the range of possibilities, inclusive, that x can go into. And now I want to divide it evenly. Um, using integer operations. Uh, So for the base case uh, of zero, where where this is zero and two, uh, obviously I can't divide it into. Okay. Actually, wait. These are inclusive. Um, so what does it mean when m1 is equal to m2? So m1 is always going to be at least Okay, yeah, for the first case, m1 will be 0 and m2 will be 1. I think this is fine. Yeah, m1 and m2 are not going to be the same ever. So I just have to use, I just have to use the positions at m1 and m2. And m2 is never going to be v dot size, right? Yeah, this because this will always be less than LBs or than than UB so this will be less than v dot size times 3 so yeah m2 is m1 is going to be between 0 so we always have um, this this relationship which is perfect these are exactly the breakpoints i want flush and now the judge should send me back which one it is right okay okay um Okay, so you don't actually signal that you're printing out the line. It's just you, you print out more than three numbers, and the judge figures out that that means that that you are done. Okay. Um, so this means that the lower bound of where to place x is going to be m1 plus 1. Yeah. 
uh, no, noting that where I place the position where I place it is is right before the number of that index. So yeah, so that's fine. Um, these are these are. Splitting it into three disjoint cases. So that's good. Okay. If, if it's VM1, do I have that right? No, I don't have that right. Uh, VM2 is, is like that. Yeah. Okay. And so I repeat that until I've actually settled out the exact position. And then I. Uh, and that should be it. I don't care about checking whether I've run out of queries. So let's. Um, so now the the problem is I have to figure out how to use their interactive runner. So how does this work? Well, first I have to compile. <laughs> okay. Uh, right. Wait, is this a bug with my... Why is it not including vector? That's interesting. Oh, <laughs> because I did not declare it right. Okay. Um, cool. So Python runner dot py. test.py and zero. <clears throat> okay, let's see if this works. No such file or directory. Oh. Nope. Syntax error invalid syntax. This is going to take me as long as solving the problem to get their test tool to run. But that's this is good. I mean, this is the sort of homework that I need to do before the actual contest because uh, they are going to have interactive problems. And I, I, I can't take the time in a real contest to try to get this working. 
So let's see. So judge provides TNQ. We just so three one two. So say I put one in the middle. Ah, four three three, so that's no good. Right, because these could these could actually differ by uh by just one. So um yeah, so th this is fine if they differ by two, but if they differ by just one then actually even if they differ by two there are cases where m1 and m2 could end up being the same because they, they if you multiply them by three then they differ by two uh, they differ by ub minus lb so i have to handle a case where they're the same I think this is fine. I think I could just do this. I mean, that's kind of a hack, but whatever. All right, let's try that. What do you mean by syntax error, invalid syntax? Total queries used 1465 out of 30,000. Okay, so that worked. And just to make sure, if I didn't have this, it would not work, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I, yeah, I just had a, I had a runner issue, not a, not a testing issue. Okay, so it passed test one, or test zero with flying colors. Test one. And test two. Okay, seems to pass everything. So I, I have quite a bit of breathing room actually with this solution. So yeah, I, my analysis, it did suggest that this is very close to optimal. There is definitely some tweaking you could do, or well, not definitely, but there's almost certainly some tweaking you can do, like doing multiple numbers at once to split the, the cases slightly more evenly. So this is not, the actual optimal, 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 but this is pretty close. Uh, this is, you know, asymptotically close. And um, and it's interesting, it actually doesn't have a worst case. So it actually doesn't matter whether they give us worst case input or not. Um, I'm sure it matters for other solutions. Like th they do that so that other solutions can work. But for this particular case, since I'm splitting everything evenly, really there isn't much you can do to like like sure you could always give me the worst of my three possibilities if they're not evenly split but that's that's the best you can do and that's still like basically log three of n for each for each uh, placement so cool um let's submit and there is a visible test case so i i will know if this is somehow wrong but uh i did manage to run their tester so
I assume they're not going to dig me for this. That would be really funny if, if the deleting space that I printed out somehow dinged me. But I think that they don't care about white space. So, hooray! A completely unnecessary set of points. And I'm fairly confident based on... Uh, I mean, let's try it again. Let's see what the variation is. Oh. Oh, do they not randomize it? That's interesting. I guess I probably, if I if I looked at dtest.py, it probably has a way of. Uh, yeah, so I could just replace that if I wanted to. If I wanted to actually randomize the input, but it's actually it's actually helpful that they give you a deterministic set of set of input normally, and you can randomize it if you want to. Uh, I'm not going to bother doing that. I, I I'm pretty confident that. I, I've got the correct answer. So cool. That was a neat problem. I like that one. I, I, I do like these sorting problems that are kind of different from the normal sort. All right. Um, <laughs> hooray. Four out of five problems done, which isn't bad. Let's see whether I actually have a chance on the final problem, because this does look pretty tough. I am, I am using information that not very many people have solved this problem. I'm using meta information. <laughs> Okay, uh, my recording's still working. Hooray. So, um, okay, 100 players are competing. Uh-oh, we've got real numbers coming in here. This is going to be mathy. Oh my god, and it's got a sigmoid function. This is super mathy. Oh god. For those for those of you who don't know the sigmoid is like it looks like this. So, uh, I believe I believe its asymptotes are 0 and 1, especially since they're trying to give me a probability. So, uh yeah. So I, I think this is just a way of giving me something that slowly goes from zero to one, but uh, or sorry, not slowly, but like goes to zero to from zero to one at a particular point. And of course, I think the, oh sorry, yeah, I think the the point where it crosses one half is where si is equal to qi, uh, I believe. Yeah. <clears throat> so that's that's. Just a fancy function that presumably I won't have to do anything super mathy with that. We'll see. <laughs> oh yeah, they've just described these things. So each of these answer attempts is chosen at random independently of all other choices. Okay. Exactly one of the players is a cheater. Okay. Interesting. So they're they are sort of a smart cheater. Like if they got every answer correct, then that would be too suspicious, and they would obviously be caught up for cheating. But the fact that they um, they're flipping a coin to determine which one, so they're trying to statistically disguise the fact that they're cheating, but they're not disguising it very well. So apart from the general description above, you do not know anything about the skill levels of the players or the difficulties of the questions. You must correctly identify the cheater in at least p percent of the test cases. Interesting. Now, is the strategy? It's not. It's not clear that the strategy is actually going to matter. Like the, that, this range is actually going to matter to the strategy. Um. 
like probably I am just going to end up with one person who has the maximum likelihood of being the cheater. So interestingly enough, um, this sort of has the same property as the last one, which is that I cannot distinguish between the cases where everybody is, where the skill, skill levels are going up, and so the top player is getting everything right, or the skill levels are going down, and so the, the top player is getting everything wrong. Those two cases actually look indistinguishable from me. Oh, sorry. No, no, they don't, because I, I actually get correct or incorrect. Yeah, okay, sorry. It's, it's not, if I were getting the guesses that they made, then that would be different, but the fact that I'm actually getting correct or incorrect, I can I can rank them based on skill levels. P is equal to 86. Interesting. You do have a lot of players, so you've got a lot of data. And the players are going to be chosen uniformly from this range, so you can roughly order them by So it's possible you don't need to do anything math mathy for this problem. So suppose you've you've pulled the cheater out of the set. So you're left with, say, one players one, two, five, six, seven. So suppose you've identified the cheater. You can sort, you can then sort these just based on the number of questions they get right. And that is roughly going to correspond with their skill levels. Um, you can also you can also sort the problems. So you can sort the players, and you can sort the problems. Uh, by how many people got them wrong. I mean, I'm really leaning towards just a simple solution here. Where like you compute some sort of likelihood, but but like the likelihood is probably going to be pretty strongly in favor of the cheater. If you just do anything, that's that's kind of reasonable, in my opinion. Maybe that's not the case. Maybe you really do need to go dig more into the weeds of the actual likelihood calculation. Um, But I'm actually thinking like I can just assign assign these players, you know, I, I can I can uniformly distribute these players from from as skill levels, and I can and then I can uniformly distribute the the questions uh, sorted by by difficulty level. That's going to be pretty close to the correct values. Um, I use that to compute the probability of each result. Like I just take, you know, I just take a log sum of, of the probability of each player getting something right. And then I take the probability of, I guess the one problem is I don't know, I don't know the skill level of the cheater. OK, 
okay, so that's interesting. So the 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 more skilled the cheater is, the harder he will be to detect because um, most of the time he's going to get a question right anyway. I can, um, so there are 10,000 questions. That's a long trivia tournament, I gotta say. So I can subtract 5,000 questions. I can assume that the cheater is gonna get 5,000 questions right. I can, I, and then I can, you know, figure out n minus 5,000 over 5,000, uh, like n number of corrects minus 5,000 over 5,000. Then they're, they're, that's their actual accuracy. Uh, I can estimate their skill level that way as well. All right, well, let's give it a try. I mean, this is a pretty simple solution, which may, which worries me a little because so few people have it solved. Um, but the thing is the numbers are so large that probabilities, I think the prob probabilities usually just end up um, completely pointing to one person, no matter, even even if you do something that's not strictly optimal, I think you're going to end up with a pretty pretty strong signal towards the cheater. I guess we'll see. Anyway, maybe maybe not that many people wanted to deal with like logs, log sum of probabilities or something like that. Um, you, you you can't multiply the probabilities because you are going to seriously underflow when you're considering a hundred characters. Sorry, hundred players times ten thousand questions. So um, you do have to use uh, you do have to use logs. To, to do any sort of reasonable comparison. Okay, well, um, <laughs> so there are actually 50 meg megabytes of input. Um, I am a little worried that, well, they're both visible. So I, if I, if I, I can do the studio trick, sync with studio. Uh, trick if I need to, but I don't think I need to. I have gotten into the habit of using CN all the time because I write a lot of judge solutions. I am a judge for the world finals, and so uh, I um, so I, I try to use the input that is slowest, <laughs> so that I can you know make sure that that my solutions are equivalent to the lowest common denominator. And, and that, that they're not based on having fast input. So it's kind of funny, as a competitive programmer, that's, that's the opposite of what you want to do. But as a judge, you kind of want to, um, you want to pick the slower methods, the slower correct methods of doing things, just to make sure that it's not going to penalize students who do it. Um, doesn't matter at all. I mean, I mean, who cares? Like, <laughs> I, I'm going to try to answer all of them correctly. It's not like the, the problem is going to be like, the, the program is going to be like, well, I think I've got enough of them. I'm just going to go home. <laughs> uh, okay, so... just to uh, okay um, so 
So this will be players. Players and questions. So I'm really just I'm I'm collecting uh collecting how many uh problems each player gets right and how many uh questions sorry how how many how many questions each player gets right and how many players get each question right. Um do I need to worry about performance here? I don't think I need to worry about performance. So I can just try So I want the highest likelihood. So I will be starting from that. Um, so th this will be the cheater. I don't think I need to correct for the questions that the cheater gets right because on average each each question will get 0.5 extra of a player or less than 0.5 extra of a player but I think it affects all the questions equally so uh, it does not affect their sort order which is what's important so um, it, it, uh, it does affect the player sort order so that's why I need to do this um, Yes, so for the cheater, I will pretend that they didn't get 5,000 correct. seems reasonable. <clears throat> so this is pretending that they didn't get 5,000 of them right and then scaling it back up to, to 10,000. Okay, so now I'm going to assume that the players are evenly distributed and the questions are evenly distributed. I'm going to compute my log li likelihood.
Actually, you know what? I think I am going to have runtime problems because I'm going to I'm going to be doing a hundred floating point calculations. <laughs> uh, I can always most of the time players are going to be in the right in the same position so I could always just memoize okay let me let me do it the slow way first and then we'll see if that's just too slow and if it is then I will memoize um, Ooh, let's see if uh, let's see if they use C plus plus seventeen. <laughs> uh, so this is going to be. Actually, you know what? I do need the uh, I do need the cube position. All right. So p pause is going to be uh, um. Do I do I care that much about making it exact? Probably not. Nah, yeah, I don't I don't care about making it exact. I I, I just need to be close enough. So, uh, six times uh, p pause over hundred. So this is this is p uh, value. Really, I should be doing this. Okay. Correct probability is equal to
am getting that order right because I'm not even sure I'm is there a way I can test this simple output is the actual cheater so I, I could just test to make sure that I get the actual cheater here um, okay So I will add the probability of them getting it right as opposed to the probability of that, them getting it wrong. Um, doesn't matter which log I use. It's just a linear multiplier. Um, CP else. Okay. Uh, just in case. Not actually sure what the lower bound is. Are the okay, the, the player numbers are starting from one, so Okay. <clears throat> All right, I don't have a lot of confidence in this, but uh, that I got this right the first time, but we'll see. I do need to download this. Oh, geez. All right, that does look right. So, okay, uh, pval is not declared. definitely need to speed this up. Okay, so that didn't work. Um, Yeah, let me memoize.
So this one looks the same, unfortunately. I'm not sure I'm exactly calculating a likelihood correctly. What I'm doing is I'm multiplying the probability of Yeah, what I'm doing is I'm computing the probability of seeing this exact result with um, with these with these evenly distributed skills and evenly distri distributed question difficulties, um, which should approximate the correct likelihood. Uh, I'm sure that there is more math to do, but the problem is, but or sorry, but the, the the nice thing is I don't need to compute an actual likelihood distribution for the cheaters. I just need to identify the maximum one. So. Uh, I, I can I can distort the the data all I want. I just I just need to identi identify what the maximum point is. Uh, clearly, I'm doing that wrong though. So 59 is giving it. All of these are looking exactly the same, whereas I would hope that this would stick out, and it's not sticking out. This actually looks very similar. Now. This actually does, I mean, this actually is less than this. So why is, sorry, it's gr greater than this. Why am I not returning it? Uh, oops. <laughs> that was stupid. Okay, so I'm getting it wrong. At least it is running fairly quickly. Um, Right, I'm not, I'm not taking into account the actual cheater. Um, Still not working. The problem is I, I have no idea how to debug this. <laughs> um, this data is hard to see. So this is one. Okay. So this is the cheater. Boy, this input looks pretty random, doesn't it? Oh, uh, okay. So this is the cheater. So what I want to see is that this is not, that this does not correlate very strongly with the problems that other people are getting wrong. So like, this one, this set of three is wrong, is consistently wrong for most of them. Okay. Do I just not have enough precision? Is that the problem?
Wait a second. Why is this? Oh. This is just sorted. I must be using, I must be confusing the player number and the, uh, uh, yeah, that's the problem. P.S. I. So that's the position. This is a hard problem to debug, unfortunately. 76, damn it. This actually looks worse than all the others. Maybe not all the others. that a little um, so this is the player number this is the player position wait I, I think I'm Ah, uh, I messed that up. <laughs> when I moved the uh, 100. No, that is right. Yeah, six, six, point, six times PPAWS over 100. This is what's wrong. Really, I should be adding. Just to be correct. Maybe it's three. Yeah, I think it's three. Just just to get them in the middle of the intervals rather than rather than being biased slightly downwards. Um, not that it, I doubt it matters. Still not right. This looks like the lowest now. Am I ordering it incorrectly so that actually I want the lowest rather than the highest? Yeah, I'm ordering the questions incorrectly because the the lower skill valued questions are the ones that uh, uh, that have the most players. I mean, really, I should just do. Uh, I want the number that get it. Sorry, I don't want to think through this, so I'm just going to reverse that. Uh, and the players, I do want to sort. Their skill levels are sorted in, in terms of number, how many problems they've got, and the questions are sorted in inverse order of how many players managed to solve them. Okay, I have made a lot of mistakes in the math here, <laughs> and this is really annoying to actually debug. My numbers are getting larger and larger. <laughs> 
Damn it, still not right. Still, 59 is still not sticking out of the pack. Oh, sorry, 58. That should be sticking out of the pack. Uh, really wish there's some way to some way to properly debug this. I guess I could try to do a reduced test case. I've sort of been relying on, uh, on just looking at the code and looking for things that are wrong in the code, but unfortunately that only gets you so far. At some point you need to just try test cases. nicer way of saying this is this. So that goes from 0 up to 99.5. This goes from 0 up to... I'm just trying that just to see if it makes a big difference. I don't think it should, but... The thing is, when I get this right, I expect this number to just be obvious. Like, I expect that to just stand out from the pack. I mean, unless it is a particularly well-skilled cheater. Uh, it, it, I guess it actually does kind of look like it's, he's a very skilled cheater because he does have a very large percent of the percentage of the questions right. Um, wow. So what I'm outputting is 48, and 48 has almost none of the problems right. Maybe I should just be doing this. Because really this should be the case. Nope. 
Nope. I feel like the last couple of years I also messed up the uh, the final question of the qualification round like this. I'm not sure. I don't even remember if I managed to solve them. What's a little annoying here is that I think I I think this solution should work. Um, it's possible I'm just completely wrong, and and this solution doesn't work I'm th that these likelihoods or these probabilities are not comparable directly uh, as likelihoods um, Okay, for these, for things like 48, the fact that 48 has so many wrong answers and is still getting a high likelihood for me, that is bad. So I am definitely doing something that I can debug, which is good. Uh, so 48, so many of these are wrong answers. So the likelihood should be tiny. Like this QCP should be so tiny. So 48 is one of the worst, so that's interesting that I'm outputting it. So PVAL is... Okay, so QCPs look right here.
Okay, so this all looks reasonable. He's getting zero for all the hard problems. Okay, so now he's the cheater. So he should be getting multiplied by all of these. Like he should be getting multiplied by basically 2 to the negative 5,000. So that should really show up, really, really show up. This is the score if he's not a cheater. He is the cheater. Yeah, so he's losing like 5,000 if he's considered the cheater. Wait, am I outputting? I thought I was outputting 40 before. Oh, now I'm outputting. Oh, that must have been an earlier bug. Oops. Okay, well, at least this looks right for 48. Like, 48 should be... should be terrible. And so it is, although the variation is not that large. So it's not a clear signal, but it is it is fairly good. Like I expect this to be a really bad probability. Um, Is the swing, is there too much variance from shuffling the players around? Is that the problem? Should I just be... I just be keeping things relatively constant and only moving the cheater around? Maybe that's my problem. I'm getting too much variance by by shuffling all these players' positions around. That's my current theory. Because just look at these swings. I mean, these swings are pretty large. So instead, I said I'm just going to pre-calculate all of them. I don't need the memo then.
so This is cheater pause. Um. to specifically do the cheater. I need to figure out his position. This is the scaled amount that we would get. Um, All right, let's see if that variance has, has gone down now. I don't need ops anymore.
nine is what I want. Fifty nine has the most questions solved. Wow, that's funny. Curious exactly how many uh, questions he gets right scaled up. Oops. So scaled up gets. This is a weird test case. Why did they give us this kind of weird test case? Where this is not an average test case. The the, the person who's gotten the, the actual cheater is also the most skilled out of all of them. The chance of that is one in a hundred. The cheater is chosen uniformly at random from among all players and independently of all their choices. Maybe that's the problem. Maybe this is just not... not a very fair test case. Because this is the hardest to distinguish case, where the cheater is actually far better than all the others. And you don't, don't have much information to go on. I guess you still should be able to figure it out just from correlations. Maybe my probability multiplication is not the correct thing to do. Maybe that's the problem. Maybe what they did is they gave us they gave us literally the hardest that the case could be, where the, the actual cheater is also the best. All other cases are easier than this. Um, I'm kind of tempted just to submit my code and yeah, I'm going to submit my code just to see whether it gets the 10% the case right. I don't think it's going to get the 86% case right. I don't think it's going to get the 10% case right either. What I'm seeing from here is just that there's this there's this valley. It's probably just always going to pick whoever's in this valley. It's not really using the correlations of the questions properly. What I should do is I should generate my own data. I think I should do that. I don't think there's any point in submitting this because Okay, I'm going to generate some data.
right distribution. about right okay um, A different possible approach, instead of computing these likelihoods, what I could do is I could try to predict the like, I could predict whether they'll get each problem right, and see how many, see how off I am. That's interesting. That actually doesn't use probabilities at all. I just sort the, sort the questions for each player find the best cutoff point um, the cutoff point where they have the fewest zeros before it and the most ones after it or sorry the, the fewest well wh whatever you know the fewest zeros before it and fewest ones after it find find that minimum cutoff point uh, find the player that has the worst of those minimums and they're the cheater Actually, that's that's an interesting solution. I, I think I might try that. Since this uh, this likelihood is getting me nowhere, unfortunately, I really thought it would work. Uh, but oh well. Um.
of the header and weight-wise. Is that right? I'm not sure if that's right. Okay. Yeah, so I'm not getting any of these right at all. <sighs> well, it's good to know. Okay, make a backup. Let's try the other solution, which is a lot simpler. the minimum the minimum differences from I want ones 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 zero zero zeros so I want the differences from that um, so I want the number of So that's the number of zeros up to it, and then and then I want the number of ones after it. All right, this is a much simpler solution, at least. <laughs> uh, let's see if it actually works, if it does anything right. Uh. Oops, why did I say that? It's a double.
Got one right. Got two right. <laughs> well, this simple solution is getting, looks like, more than one out of ten. Definitely not getting 86%. If I were to guesstimate, I would say it's getting like 30 to 40% of them right. It's better than nothing. Why is my likelihood solution just failing so miserably. There must be just some bug because I feel like the probability should work. I don't know how much long I'm, longer I'm going to keep on grinding on this. Um, well, at least submit this. This part. So I'm expecting one check mark out of two. It is interesting. My, my intuition is pretty bad for this problem. I, I'm sort of assuming, like, in my opinion, it should just, the cheater should just stand out using multiple measures. That's obviously not the case. So my intuition is completely failing me here. Let me, uh, let me print out what the actual skill level of the cheater is. just so I can verify that the, the hardest ones are the ones where the cheater is best. Yep, so when the cheater is bad, then they just stand out. It's when the cheater is good that I'm getting it wrong. So I've been streaming for two and a half hours. Um, I'm sure everybody's bored by now. Uh, I'm going to think about the problem for another 10 minutes or so. And then if I can't come up with a way to improve my probability significantly or fix my, fix my likelihood solution, because my likelihood solution should address this, 
right? There should be one person who is getting occasional problems that they should not get. Oh, you know what my simple solution is missing? Oh, uh, okay, so there actually is a bit of a problem here in that the cheater is not going to get, the cheater is only going to get incorrect ones. It's not going to, the cheater is not going to get incorrect zeros. So actually, I'm not sure I should be including incorrect zeros here. Uh, but then how do I correctly estimate that? So here's a thought. I um, actually don't need to try all the possibilities here. What I can do is I can estimate if they were the cheater. If they were the cheater, then they would look, then I would pick this cutoff point and it would look roughly like ones and zeros, except that half of the zeros would actually be wrong. So if, if they were the cheater, I can estimate their, their percent correct just by doing this, you know, minus 5,000 uh, times two. And then what I expect is that this is, this is the number correct. So what I expect is that it should look roughly like roughly like this. Of course, there's going to be a lot of variation, but roughly like this, except that 50% of these are going to be, sorry, 50% of these are going to be wrong. So how do I how do I compare these fairly between different values of NCs? Um, I 
could take I could take the percentage that are passed in C and then I can figure out I can just compute how many of them are wrong and I can take the closest to 50%. Okay. So going to do that right away because honestly there's no reason he should not be able to get 5,000. Um, now are suspected cheated. Um, So I expect half of those to be wrong. And so the probability So I'm going to pick the one that, that looks most, that is closest to 0.5 wrong. Uh, now actually this is going to be a bit iffy for, this is going to be a bit iffy for students that get it right. Because um, the variance, the swing there is going to be very high. What I should be doing is I should be weighting this based on how likely it is that this is that this is pure chance. So again, I need to get into likelihoods and stuff. And this is completely failing. Okay, so even if I cut off the hard ones, this is still failing. So I'm doing something wrong. This is actually an interesting thing I can do. I can, I can assume that it's not going to be a really hard, or a really high skilled player, and then you know I can I can I can lose fourteen percent of that. That uh, um, state space. Oh my goodness, <laughs> N C minus. Ah.
Okay, so I'm still not getting this right. So I'm not, I'm not getting the easy cases right. Uh, why? I should be applying likelihoods here. This is such a such a hack. I'm I'm sure I'm not going to get the correct accuracy without without likelihoods, and I'm not getting likelihoods to work. I don't know why. What what is wrong with my likelihood calculation? the problem. Still not working. Yeah, I, I think this is totally bogus. I think my, my justification here is just totally bogus. <laughs> I mean, I'm not taking into account that some of these ones are going to be scattered around. And like, obviously, it's not going to start with all ones. And I'm completely ignoring that. And Yeah, the, the way to improve it is to use likelihood, and it, my likelihood is not working. I do like that I have this nice and simple solution that uh, I have this nice and simple solution that gets, you know, like 30% of them. <laughs> so that's not bad. Um, I do think that <sighs> maybe I just have a bug. Maybe Maybe my likelihood is somehow wrong, or maybe... I need a better likelihood way, a better way of calculating likelihood. Uh, those two are both possible. So this is a case that is moderate difficulty and
Is that right? So it should be 13. What? 13 is the cheater, but 13 only got 2,500, right? Oh damn it. I got my I got my test harness wrong. Whew. Unfortunately that means my previous results were bogus. Somehow I managed to get it correct anyway. Okay. 68, I get it right, 51, I get it right, 94, 94 is the absolute top, so of course I got that wrong. This is E2. So E2 is getting things right. All right. Maybe maybe I just didn't have enough confidence. Because they gave us because they gave us a test set that was as hard as possible where the there were the the best possible player was the cheater. Oops. Oh my god, this is getting most of them right. <laughs> After all this time, I had a correct solution in E2. Or at least, I mean, it's pretty good. I don't know if it's exactly 0.86, but it's getting most of them right. I think it's getting enough of them right that I could submit multiple times and... Oh, I just had the, the test hardest wrong. Oh, no. <laughs> that is embarrassing. If, if the test hardness had been right, I would have I would have realized that my likelihood solution was working. My intuition was actually right. Like my, my likelihood solution is actually good. Oh, what a bunch of wasted time. This is a very embarrassing video. <laughs> Oh well. So what I what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna keep submitting um, because I I don't think I quite have 86% based on what I'm looking at. So I'm not sure what the exact probability is that I'm going to get it right. Let me let me uh, just do something in my test harness to
So I, I'm close, but it looks like I need some tweaking on my likelihood function to actually get it right. The question is, how close am I? Oh, okay, I'm, I'm quite far away. Uh, okay, I look better than that from my from my eyeballing. Um, okay, still, it's it's good to know that my likelihood is at least vaguely right. Um, Obviously, it still needs tweaking. So I'm getting 60% of them right, and I need 86% of them. That is, that is not within the, the range of being able to just submit until I get it right. Um, yeah, if I don't have any better ideas, I think I'm just going to give up. What can I do to improve this likelihood? So I could go back to my original approach of sorting them, although it did look like the variance was high enough that um, like the original approach where I, where I sort the players for each choice of cheater. Another thing I'm not using I can do a better measure of the question skill level I can do better than than uniformly distributing the questions in the players actually that's that's how you I think you have to actually use math you have to um, or I, I suppose you can do a uh, sort of a, a mathematical a, a function optimization where you like turn a research on the uh, the likelihood for each for each individual questions uh, skill level I could try that So except for the one spoiler who is the cheater, this actually gets you a pretty good approximation of the skill levels of the problem set and the and the players, except for the cheater. You, 
you can um, so okay so here's what I'm thinking of so let me close my whiteboard so for a given question you can you can try each of the skill levels find uh, you, you first you start with the players being uniformly distributed and then for each question you uh, find you turn to research or, or you use math to find the minimum um, uh, sorry to find that well it's the maximum likelihood it's the yeah to find the maximum likelihood skill level of the, of the question and then you do the same to the, the players and you and you turn to research each of the players to find the, the maximum likelihood based on the question and you continue to do this and I think it's going to converge to something that is pretty close to the actual skill levels This might be too slow, since there are 10,000 problems and 100 players. But anyway, I think I think that that is the fix to make my likelihood solution a little little bit better, is that you have to accurately estimate the skill levels of the problems and the questions, or the the players and the questions. Um, And then that makes the likelihood calculation that much better for determining who is the cheater. Whereas my current my current approach is just picking a uniform distribution like that, which is close. I mean, it is going to be roughly like that, but obviously it's going to be uh, a little bit more, it's not going to be uniformly sp spaced. So, um, and I guess you get that extra bit of accuracy that you need in order to get 86% over 60%. Uh, it's not even clear how much accuracy you need. Like um, a small change in accuracy could make a very large difference in the percent of the cases that you get right. <clears throat> You should also take into account which of these is the cheater in theory, but uh, in practice, I suspect it doesn't matter too much in aggregate. You, you probably don't need to do this for each choice of cheater. You could do this for each choice of cheater, but I think you probably don't need to. Um, and you'd run out of time if you tried to do this for each choice of cheater. Do I want to implement this for a small chance of getting it correct? The video is three hours long. I think it's too long. I think I've been going too long and I am tired, as you can probably tell. <laughs> so Yeah, disappointing as it is, I think I might leave it at this. 
So I apologize to those of you who are hoping for um, an actual solution to this. I, I did stumble around on it for like two hours, so I, I apologize. It was like an hour and a half. And I had various bugs. I had a bug in my test harness. <laughs> um, I had a bug in my test harness, which test harness harness, which led me that and the fact that that the test input that they gave you was the worst possible test input they could give you um, led me to believe that my likelihood based solution was worthless when it was not worthless. It was actually pretty good. It's got it gets like 60 percent of the, the cases right. It just doesn't get 86 percent of them right because it's not quite accurate enough. So I did fumble around a lot. Anyway, uh, I think that's it. So thank you for sticking around if you if you did watch this. Um, I hope some people found it edifying. Uh, this was fun. I, I like these problems. This is an interesting problem, and I look forward to reading the editorial of how to actually solve it and see whether my my likelihood calculations are at all correct or whether I'm doing something completely mathematically wrong. So thank you, everybody. And I will see you for round one.